So now I want to get into the discussion part of today. So we're going to welcome in two of the most important voices in art in this country. The Brit-nominated rapper who has tackled issues like ADHD, neurodiversity, injustice, black masculinity, Yomi Sode, one of the most important poets in this country. Let's, let's give it up for them. Yo, what's up? What's up? Um, how you guys doing? I'm all right. I'm sitting next to this guy. Sitting next to this guy. This is exciting stuff. No, make some noise for them. This is this is this is this is it. Make some noise for Atian, man. This is it. Um, so a big part of this talk is about redefining uh, masculinity. In both of your works, a big point of unity is the fact that you. Um, comment on emotions that men are not allowed to express outwardly. I think the only permissible kind of emotion that you're allowed to have in a traditional form of masculinity is anger. But you guys touch on loss, sorrow, grief, acceptance, healing in your art. How do you think, in the context of a lot of the conversations about toxic masculinity, we can push forward towards healthier expressions and ideas of masculinity. Can I go? A good example of it is just now with Lero, right? That's how you say his name, Lero? Um, his poem made me cry. I was just stood right, like right there, obviously. I'm watching it and it moved me in a way, you know, because I'm seeing someone young who reminds me of myself, or reminds me of kids who I saw at school, who were my peers, expressing an emotion or expressing emotion and feelings that when I was even at school 10 years ago, whatever wasn't conveyed, you know, and I got embarrassed as soon as I started getting emotional about it. And I didn't want them to see me crying. I didn't want to see them, like, see my tears. And I think a good way to remedy that is to do this exactly is to just speak to say, hey, this thing hit me in the heart and it makes me feel a certain way. So I'm going to express that, you know, so that's a good example of like right here, right now, how immediate it can be, you know. You. There you go. Then people start clapping when you cry as well. It's epic. <laughs> Um, so what about you, Yomi? So I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't born in England. I was born in Nigeria. Um, it's, a, it's a story I say from time to time. Like, I arrived in England when I was nine, and I hardly spoke any English. And when I came in, when I came in to primary school, my first experience, like, um, I, was wearing, like, I was wearing, like, gym gear. Like, everyone's got, like, the, the latex, like, going down to the, to the ankles. I had it to the thighs. Baggy top. This is how my mum set me up my first day in school bless her heart. And I'm there waving to everyone. I was like, yeah, I'm here to make friends. And it was like, who are you, bro? What's going on? And I cried that, I cried that day. I was really sad uh, and what have you. And um, I remember, similar to Loyal saying, like I was when I was hiding it. And things really took a turn as I started to grow in terms of thinking that, oh, I don't know what this, this whole thing of showing emotion looks like. Until, if I'm honest with you, I became a father. And the idea of my, my, my boy, like, listen, as soon as he hears a string or like violin, anything, he gets in, intensely emotional. And I'm just like, but he feels comfortable around me. And it just made me look into what this thing is in terms of open into vulnerability and what that looks like, which then feeds into the writing, which then kind of led into me thinking about my younger self. Like, I would have wanted someone to be there, to comfort that, to make that space as open as possible to be like, you can cry, you can get emotional if you want to, you can be vulnerable, mm -hmm. and we can still, and everything complements the fact that you're funny, the fact that you're boisterous, the fact that you like the banter from time to time. You are human at the end of the day, and you shouldn't be holding anything away from me. So, for me so far, that's how I take from it, you know? Yeah, it's really interesting that you guys gave the answer, because I think when we look at like sports, they represent a kind of idealized, concept of masculinity and we're witnessing a change in some of the values that are like put forward. We're seeing people like Saka, Rashford, they're not only wealthy and powerful and successful and good at football, but they're also advocating for other people. Um, and within both of your work, you look very outwards. And I had, and I, when I was like in pr preparation for this, one of your points of unity is that you both have sons, right? And you, you've both been hugely successful at what you've done, and that success gives you some like proximity from some of the violence that young black 
young black men, young men in, in British society face. How has having, if it has, how has having children refocused you on, on those kind of topics? Because you guys are out of it, but you still speak about it. Uh, as a parent, I, I worry more, a bit more. Like I, you know, it changes consistently as the, as the years go on. So for me, my, my ultimate thing is how to best protect my son, but at the same time, and my daughter, but at the same time, it's knowing how to write on these situations and experiences and what I've gone through. You know, I can't necessarily hide about, I can't hide my own experience of what I've, what I've gone through. Do you see what I mean? And it's something in my story that could relate, that we found something to relate on, that we talk on whenever we, whenever we break bread. Do you see what I mean? So I think that kind of storytelling for me doesn't necessarily stop. But at the same time, living it as a parent, it doesn't make it any easier also because I know the environment in which my boy is growing up in. I, I agree. I just think as a parent, you, you know, when you're living through something, you know, when I was growing up, because I grew up around here, um, I grew up in Croydon, like a lot of the stuff I was seeing, I wasn't able to process it. Do you know what I mean? So I'm looking at it like this. And I think when you become a parent, you have a little bit of a bird's eye view. So you're able to, to look, kind of look at your own youth and your experiences and, you know, the 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 missteps you've taken, you know what I mean, the mistakes you've made, but also kind of the successes you've had and and gain some understanding of as to why those things are happening and to see the patterns that are going to occur for more failures or for more success, right? So I guess like any generation, you're the people who are younger than you are able to stand on your shoulders because, you know, we've made X amount of mistakes that, you know, my son, mm -hmm. you know, my son don't need to make, you get me? But like also there's things that my son will need to do that I can't tell him. I could tell him a million times, like, hey, you can't do this. You shouldn't be there. This is going to hurt. Until he is hurt, you know, until his fingers are burnt by the flame, he doesn't know that fire is hot, you know? So I and think, yeah. And even there was one point when he was younger, there was one kid that was picking on him. And my uncle, my, my uncle, like, he's like, ah, just kick him now. Just, do, you know, bah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and he's like, oh, but no. And, and my uncle's like, but, why? He, he won't leave you alone. If you don't, if, if, he, if he gives you pepper, give him pepper back, you know, give him. And it's like, but it's violent. And we don't, I don't, we don't believe in violence. And I was like, whoa. There was ever like an EastEnders doof doof. That would have been the moment right there. Because then it just showed that kind of time. It's like, exactly to what Lola is saying. It's like, when I was younger, it's almost like there's a survival tactic. And I'm sure not to speak for you, bro, it's like, you kind of, you have to survive in your environment, you know? Like the book kind of starts off in that. But for someone like, say, my boy who's of a different generation, he's, he, having gone through that, it's not something that I would want him to go through, you know? So for him, it's totally different. For him, it's like, this is just violence and I d it's not something that I'm geared up to do, you know? But the, with, with that missing, there will be something else, you know? So yeah. Just like the generations before us, you know what I mean? Like for my father, maybe he wasn't able to express his emotions at all, so I'm able to. But that doesn't mean that they don't manifest negatively at times, right? Yeah. So then my son's is like, okay, now he's trying to find a way to navigate his emotions in a positive way, in a, in a healthy way, maybe even than myself when I was his age. But then there'll be another obstacle, because that's how it's been for forever, you know? Mm. That you, know you, you kind of, you complete the task that your parent couldn't complete, and then you get smacked with another one, mm. you know? And then that's kind of for you to figure out and to pass that on to my son's son or daughter, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which is exciting. You're just a link in the chain, you know? I yeah, like 100%. That. Just like kind of speak, speaking from the perspective of young people, like there's loads of things um, that you want to say that people don't want to hear, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that, yeah, like no one wants to hear anything that's real. If you look like in, in, the, in the 2018 kind of era, there was a lot of suppression of like drill music, right? We could all have a long debate about the validity or invalidity of what they're saying, but they're reflecting on the violence of British society. Mm. But everyone's like, we don't want to hear that. Yeah. How, in terms of as artists, do you guys push forward with saying things that you know people don't want to hear? Yeah, I see, I see myself as a Trojan horse, mm. basically. You know, yourself included in that. Atian, just come on tour with me. 
Um, we toured around Europe, we toured around the UK, and this is a good example of it because, you know, people kind of sometimes look at me like friendly neighbourhood, Lower Kana, you get me like, I haven't lived through a lot of the same experiences that a lot of my homies have because my music is maybe softer or more delicate or I speak more eloquently um, about how I feel. And so they forget that I grew up in exactly the same place as a lot of the people who are making a lot of the music that mm. is being condemned and banned, which I don't agree with. Mm. But I think what's so cool is that then, like, if I use myself for the way I'm meant to be used as a Trojan horse, I step on stage, everyone thinks, oh, it's a safe space, nothing's going to happen, I'm not going to be challenged. And then Atian walks out and confronts them with, um, on my album, there's, there's a speech where um, it's something that had blown up way before I, I put it on my, my album, but um, it's Atian talking about knife crime, right? And I think, for me, it was essential to always remind people, no matter where you are listening to music, that all of our realities are the same. You get me? Because I think it's very easy to forget that. So, yeah, that's how, I, for me, that's how I see it, as like, not trying to put people off at the beginning, but make sure the message is there. But it breaks my heart, because drill for me is something that like, especially when I was first listening to it, you know, from, from Chicago, from Chirac, and over here at the same time, like, that is just a response to the times. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's no point squashing it and getting rid of it, because the expression of that pain and grief and suffering, which is all of these, all of these young, young men and women are doing, is gonna manifest itself in another way, right? To take away the outlet, the art outlet, is putting, you know, the pressure back down and the pressure cooker for it to exist somewhere, which is only going to be violence or, you know, an explosion. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I still have my grime, like, vinyls. Like, when Dizzy Rascal first came out, but I love you, I still have that. You know, so my, my kind of trajectory of, of listening to music and listening to, like, I'm, like, from So Solid and what have you, like right up to like what we're talking in terms of drill a lot of that is is referenced in mannerism and to how people might kind of take to poetry in terms of in terms of what is depicted in poetry i it's it's cool i'll leave that to that in terms of how people want to speak on their experiences but i know that my experience from from a kid from the Ellsbury estate it needed to reflect that in terms of how i was growing and yes some of it is it touches on violence and some of it touches on situations that you wouldn't necessarily want to be in. But for me, it, it was such a norm. And, you know, it's cracking up when you mention it because it's like people might kind of hear me and be like, oh, yeah, but yeah, your life was, you, and I'm like, but you don't know anything about my life to them for the most part. And the only way that you might get to know it is if I share it in the writing and in the poems. Um, and in that kind of exploration of it, it, cr it creates a bigger discourse in, in terms of how we move forward, in terms of how you navigate it for other generations. But um, I'm for that kind of articulation, I'm for that kind of experience, and I don't necessarily feel like um, your lived experience should be silenced in any way, you know? 100%. I think another question that I kind of have is both of you, it's kind of a two-part question, both of you sometimes take like traditionalist forms and concepts and spin it. Mm. So in mannerisms, there's Caravaggio. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but language is made up anyway. Um, and then, and then um, you, um, you <laughs> it's actually ask the linguist. Um, then in in your song with any, you kind of make a, a reference to Shakespeare. Big um, tune, by the way. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Othello, Shakespeare. Othello. Yeah. yeah. How, for the young people who are sitting here, how do you think you can take some of these traditionalist concepts and ideas that you're kind of excluded from, but can, as, as people come from where we're from, but we can relate to the humanity in them because we are human beings? Because it's all the same. Because mm. all of it is the same, right? Like, we've talked about this before. Malcolm X, you must know Malcolm X, I hope. Um, Malcolm X is just as much of a poet as as I am, right? But I'm just as much of a political speaker as Malcolm X is because what we're doing is the same thing. There's a, there's a, there's a speech from a long time ago, one of Malcolm X's speeches, the ballot or the bullet, where he's essentially mm -hmm. saying that either we're gonna fight with our vote or we're gonna fight with bullets, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, just that alone, just that like, that tiny little imagery is, is, is enough to show that he's a poet, right? And so when you think about Shakespeare, you think about Chekhov, um, mm -hmm. um, playwrights, you know, that, that, that get a lot of respect. I don't see why um, whoever, insert anyone, heady one, you know what I mean? Like mm. why he cannot be seen in the same way as someone who is writing literature because he is in the same way as Shakespeare was, reflecting his times, talking about his grief. You know, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the line? Um, Babby's coming to the news, they don't really love me. 
but they love me. Mm-mm. It's deep. Do you know what I mean? You can act like it's not deep, but it is deep. You get me? There's, I, I, like for me, I've, I've always, I've always found like it's ridiculous to act like anybody who's sitting and writing on their own in solitude isn't reflecting the times. And there needs to be a, you know, like a, an, like a, a, an even slate of of what is respected as as literature. You know, for myself, if I release a poetry book, it's gonna get treated like a poetry book. Mm. If Digger D releases one, is it gonna get treated like one? Maybe not, but it should be. You know, that's kind of how I feel. There's um, I was at an art exhibition a long time ago, and um, Riz's verse from Triumph, Wu Tang Clan, um, his verse from Triumph was kind of laid out on the page. And if you look at that, it just you'd be thinking, oh, what's this poem? If you know what I mean, like if you if you and and, and the way you enter that is 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 really interesting for me. You know, Akala does this really, I don't know if you, I don't know if you know, Akala does this really interesting thing where he kind of throws the lyric and he got to work out whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's like someone like Tupac or, or Diggity. And people are going to be like, definitely Diggity, definitely. And then be like, nah, Shakespeare. Be like, you're lying. I'm just like, oh, Shakespeare was on crud. What are you trying to talk about? It was just, <laughs> Shakespeare was talking some things, if you know what I mean. But I think, for me, um, it, it's definitely a thing of, um, yes, there are, there are sonnets in, in the book, and yeah, there are all these different forms, but it doesn't necessarily mean I have to stick with it. I can kind of work with the confines of it, but it still has to be in my voice and my language and how I interpret it. Um, I don't have to kind of, I, at one point, I thought I did. At one point, I thought that I had to kind of stick to the rules, and I can't push my experiences into these forms and reimagine them and then, if I'm to be honest, I just stopped caring because I think my life is, is way more important and I want to talk about that. And I don't want to feel suffocated in any way by, by forms. Um, and I'm like, how can I put myself into this and how can I put my experience into this? But yeah, yeah. That's cool. But form is, is, is useful. It's like, you have to play the game to change the game, innit? Do you yeah. know what I mean? So you have to be within it. But what's so cool about any form and structure, if you think about poetry, is that you have it all. Do you know what I mean? All of the things that have come before, you have them at your disposal. If you want to use them, you can use them. Mm. But you don't have to use them. You know? The beauty of that is if you, like, uh, there's a guy, I don't know if I'm going to make myself sound old, but there's a guy I love called D'Angelo, right? And he was part of a group called the Soul Quarians. That's loads of producers, musicians. And when they were making this album called um, Voodoo, which is a classic album, if you haven't classic heard it, if, if you're too young, which I think you might be, um, you should check it out, right? Um, but anyways, anyways, forget how old I am, right? Um, what, what he's doing in that, when, when he was making that, he was listening to an even older artist that you probably don't know as well called Prince. And he's, they, they were in the studio listening to a lot of Prince, right? And they were basically, when they first started making a song, every song they would listen to a song by Prince and then recreate it. They would make the same song, they would play it. And then over the time of jamming, it would go from being a Prince song into a song that was a little bit different, it had some variation, they would start to push it in different directions. Mm. And then it became theirs. And I think you can do the same. You can take something that exists, no matter what the discipline is, not only in creative arts, just in, in life. You take something that already exists and begin to chip away until it reflects something that is true to you. But you've come from this place of a form and structure that already exists, right? You're kind of standing on that and then just leaping off it, So And it is the reinvention of Use it. Use it, yeah. One of my mentors, um, I... I put a poem to him and it was like 18 lines and he came back to me and he said, oh, I need you to say everything you're saying to me, but in five lines, I looked at him like, well, what are you talking about right now? And he's like, but 18 lines come back to me in five lines. And I think in terms of having that kind of structure and form, and once you work with it and you know how to do it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It doesn't mean you have to like, again, bring it, bring it out every single time, but it's just knowing that you have the ability to actually do that and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's possible, but yeah. Yeah, um, to challenge you guys. Oh gosh. When when you kind of sometimes speak about artistic expression with so much ease and ability, it's because you're you. But the kind of thing I want to trace back to you is if you were a young person sitting in this hall and you're right at the beginning and expressing yourself creatively seems like an entirely daunting task, Mm -hmm. how do you take that step to just do it? Like what, if there's any advice that kind of kept you going when it felt difficult to say things that you thought or ideas that you had out loud, what kind of pushed you to, to go in that direction? Um, it took a while for me to find my voice, I'm not gonna lie. It took, it, took me, it took me a while to find it because I didn't know if I could. I didn't know if I could, um, I didn't know if I could write by the ends. I, could, I didn't know if I could kind of like, like 
talk about like stuff that I really geek out about that I really enjoy because I felt like this is what this is this is how the country is laid out and this is the kind of work that needs to go out into the world until I actually tried it and I actually done I I I followed the rules I done all of these different things I tried to kind of kind of play along the kind of lines of it and it just was it still didn't bring me any results and I was just like but I still felt like I was suppressing myself a lot of the time and I think there was so much going on in the world that I just got to a point that I just wanted to talk more about it. So it started off quite small in terms of trying to find my voice. I have a small pocket of friends um, that I, w- I will sound out with first before I kind of get out there. If they say, hey, yo, I'm talking crazy, I'm like, I call him and slow down. Um, if, they, if they say, you know what, there's a point there and I don't really like what you're saying, then bit by bit I'm taken out there and I'm trying to kind of show out in the world. Open mics helped me a lot. Um, I touched a lot of poetry open mic nights to kind of test the waters and, and kind of gather it from there. Um, and gradually these things started to help me in the sense of trying to find voice a bit more. So that's been my main thing, has been trying to find voice. And I say this even published work, I don't know if I'm fully at the peak of finding that voice, but I'm in a better place than I was before. Yeah. I would just say, for me, my mum really believes in me a lot, right? And I think a good thing is just to find one person that believes in you, no matter who it is, a homie, a teacher, do you know what I mean, a coach, and believe them, you know? Believe that they believe in you for for a real reason. Don't doubt them, you know? Like, take the belief that they give you and run with it. But I think, like, you know, all the best people copy, man, at the start. I definitely copied, like, you know, people I was inspired by. Um, I really was inspired by a rapper called Ludacris, right? When I was yeah, growing which, up. Which tune? Yeah, oh, man, every tune. <laughs> Stand up probably was my... Was my, my my entry point. But yeah, like I used to just copy him. I dress like him. I rap like him. I, I would rewrite his lyrics and pretend they were mine. Do you know what I mean? I, I wanted to be him. And I think there's no, there's nothing embarrassing about copying someone that you like. You know, yeah. all the best people copy and all the people behind, behind closed doors that you think are like incredible off the top of their head, they were copying when they were younger, you know? So look to the people that you, that you like, that you want to be like and, and, and try and make some stuff that's like theirs, you know? And share it, you know? Find some people that want to do the same thing and, and share it. But I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's very difficult this sometimes because it's such a privileged position to sit and go, yeah, just believe in yourself or whatever, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of luck involved in, mm. in making something to yourself in certain ways. But I think that the real reason that you do it for, the reason I do it for is, is not for any of the, the stuff that comes along with it, it's to do it, you get me? Like, um, my mum is a teacher, my girlfriend is a teacher. I, I always wanted to be a teacher and, and I think I probably would still be writing raps if I was teaching English. I wanted to teach English, right? And I know for sure I would have been writing, writing rap music, writing poetry, trying to make music, trying to write plays my whole life, even if nothing ever came of it because it's something I want to do. It's not something I want to do for an end goal, you know? It's the thing I do to help me, um, yeah, make sense of my brain, you, you know what I mean? So it, you have to look at yourself and think, okay, why am I doing this? Am I doing this to make money? Because, yo, there's easier ways to make money than, than write poetry or rap, you get me? Mm. You know? Did Making you? money is easy in different ways, you know? But if you want to do something that actually lifts you, you're doing it for a reason that you love, then just keep doing it. And even if nothing else comes, you know, some of my some of my closest friends are people who don't even want to be successful, per se, success in a way that, like, I used to think about it, like, oh, I'll make loads of money and whatever, but they're successful in a way that, like, every day they wake up with an open book and they get to fill it with, with their thoughts and feelings and feel satisfied, you know? So that's what I would say, I guess. What about you? Oh, good question. Yeah. That's a question. I it's sticking at us all, all through for the best part of Use 10 that big, minutes. That big old what, brain. What, what about you? <laughs> um... No, I do actually have an answer, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Come on then. I think the moment we're living in is one where, like I read the other day, that too much of the old world is dying and not enough of the new one is being reborn. And essentially, all around us, we're seeing our social, economic, political, all of our systems that we've been told for our entire lives are going to outlive us. They're all failing. And so I think in the midst of this destruction, I can either like stay in my house and like scroll Twitter and essentially just feel super anxious about what's gonna happen. And I do spend time doing that. But there's a lot more, like uh, to me speaking out, writing, doing these things is a way of channeling my worries about the, the like dysfunctionality of the world into something that can hopefully buff other things. And I think there's something beautiful about how every you know, like they tell us that ah, oh, the world is separate. It's you, you, you. All of us are separate. But actually, the further we go along, the more we realize how interconnected we are. 
So if you say something, you're going to spark loads of kids to go on their journey. If, when you do things, it's going to spark people to start their own thing. So it's like, it's, it's recognizing there's power in people, but I have to take my step because I can ultimately only control me. So that's my answer. Love this guy. Um, this is actually crazy. These two are some of my biggest inspirations. But um, my next question is about essentially the like, as you were kind of talking about the process of art in an internal sense, and a lot of the art that's being produced right now has come from a place, and it always has been, has come from a place from using art as like a way of processing difficult emotions. And one thing in preparation for this um, talk that I realized, in both of your work, you speak a lot about bereavement and loss, but an interesting parallel is that you're both coming in from a position of having to support other people through this. How did, art help you process this when you had to uplift the people around you? Because you speak about that in both of your work. It's a heavy question. I was, I was, yeah. I was thinking, like, Raj, should I ask this right now? Well, that's a nice question. It's important. It's an important, important question. I, I don't know. I, I think that just, you know, when you're, we are talking at the beginning, right, that you're suppressing a lot of feelings, especially as a young man, all the time, and you're not really able to express how, maybe how you really feel. I think that, you know, having any sort of creative outlet or, you know, physical outlet somewhere where you can go and have some time to yourself is essential. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I, I guess for me it was like a space where if I was being strong for everybody else a lot of the time, it was a place where I could be weak, you know, like, I don't know, because I, I think even if, you know, for people who might not necessarily have to look after anyone else, I think everybody does because everybody has to look after themselves, you, you know what I mean? So I think even before I had to look after everyone in my family, I was I was getting used to kind of the idea of, picking myself up, you know, so. But yeah, I think that's it, it's just, just creating a space where, you know, for self-care, for self-help, having, a, having a, uh, 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 a place that you can go where no one else will judge you, you know, where you can talk about how you really feel. Um, it's a scary part when you start to release it. You know, that's why I'm, I'm jealous of a lot of my friends who write, but they don't want to release it, or they, you know, or they did and it didn't work out because they are then able to release, like, to create this stuff to express their feelings without the added pressure of then what will other people think, you know? More time it's that they agree and they feel the same way and you're reflecting a, a universal pain, but yeah, that's the scary bit. The writing it is not scary, you know? It's the sharing it that's scary. Um, yeah, having, like, when, when we lost a family member, um, I generally didn't know who to talk to or how to have a conversation and it wasn't until the, the, the morning and I got to my writing space and I, and I spent the best part of like 11 hours writing. And I was like, oh, that much was in you. I was like, okay, cool. That's, that's how, what my process is. And I think, yeah, I think there's something in, in writing as a, as, a, as a therapeutic process, but also as something to voice a lot of the concerns and thoughts. Um, and also, I, I guess at the time, I just didn't feel like I didn't want to burden anyone with what I was going through. But I was more than ready to listen to what everybody else, what was on their mind and how best to support them because that's naturally um, and me. So for me as a process to just to write, to share something is very difficult. Um, to write it also sometimes can be difficult depending on how vulnerable it is. But also I think it's something that naturally I do in terms of just my process because I struggle sometimes in just kind of voicing what general my concerns might be. So I kind of put a lot in the, in the time to write and a lot in the families and friends that I just want to talk. Yeah, yeah. Good answers. Um, I have one more question, then I'll hand it over to you guys. You're both, um, it, within both of your work, you, you challenge the kind of positionality of artists, um, which is kind of about how the systems that you operate within as an artist constrain or free you to, to do certain things. How do you both um, deal with the like, essentially continuing to creatively um, 
do things which are like challenging despite the um, position you're in. Do you know what I was? I was just gonna say, like, um, in listening to, especially listening to artists like Loyal, like there was these key moments and these interludes that happen as kind of like either kind of family orientated, that's with friends, um, and I think those things for me kind of break the norms of like, and I think that's it. It's almost like how do you break the norm of what this experience should be like? It shouldn't, it shouldn't just be music for music's sake, like some things just kind of encapsulate what your entire experience is. It's almost should be like what a day in the life is. I listen to um, Good Kid, Mad City, for example, and like you go through Yeah, you both all reference of Kendrick a lot. Oh, serious? This is, this is that whole the greatest, thing. The greatest. <laughs> Good Kid, Mad City is a whole, in the space of a whole day. So it's like, it's the, it's the idea of like, if we're gonna listen to this album and it's gonna be the experience of this one person for like the whole day, but we've got X amount of different tracks, but this is where it takes us in those different situations. I want to do that. I'm inspired by that kind of thinking because it kind of breaks the norm of just like, let me just write songs. But it's more a case of just let's go on a journey. And I think the same should happen in essays. The same should happen in like, whether you're writing for fiction or nonfiction, it's, it's whether you're doing an audio book, it should be the ability for you to kind of consider What's the journey that's about to happen as opposed to trying to literally do what's, what the ask is, you know? But yeah. yeah, there's just no rules. There's no rules. That's, the, that's like, that's the greatest thing about it all is that, you know, when I was studying, um, I went to drama school for a little bit and I dropped out. But when I was there, it was all so boring because it was like, the talk of it was all like, follow what people did before. This is how it has to be done. And I try and jump out of the box. And they'd be like, you can't jump out of that box because people not, won't understand. I think as you go further, you realize that like the rules are there for you to maybe to understand so you understand why you're breaking and for what reason. Mm -hmm. But I think the exciting thing is being able to push, you know, to push the boundaries. I think the way I stay so hungry to do it is because it's something that I, I, I need to do. It's not like I'm, I'm not doing it for like a re reason of like trying to wow other people or whatever, you know, it's like, I want to know what's next. As soon as I complete a part in my brain of like, okay, I did it, I pushed it this way, made myself feel uncomfortable and it worked out or sometimes it doesn't work out. I'm like, okay, well now I'm comfortable here. So now I need to go further because I don't want to be where I'm comfortable. I want to be where I'm uncomfortable, right? So that's just a continuous process until I die <laughs> of just every, every, pro every creative piece that I make has to put me out of my comfort zone, you know? And, and just, yeah, lean into that uncomfortability, you know? The book came out, cool. And then when we done a show at the South Bank, what I wanted to do was, oh, how does this, what does this book look like in, in movement? So I learned movement and dance for like, four months I, I don't dance folks <laughs> it's, it's not but I'm doing moves I never thought my body could do I'm waking up every morning and I'm aching and I'm, I'm hurt but at the same and I was uncomfortable and I was annoyed but at the same time the drive was just I, I just don't want this to be read because people take in information in different ways and if not everybody's a reader some people might like to go to the theater and watch something so what how can this be presented so I think I don't know what everyone does. I don't know your your kind of your 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 skill base or what it's set, but there is something in leaning into the uncomfortability that can be a bit shocking. But you, it kind of separates from others, and and it kind of shows you new things. Should you want to do it? Amazing! We get a round of applause for, for these guys and for Atien as well. Some noise for Atien, man.